Well, one more time, give it up for our panel here. Come on, guys, a little bit of noise. Uh, congratulations uh, on the two-part doc, a lot, part of a larger series, of course, and we'll get into all that. Uh, I had an opportunity to watch it a couple different ways. I'm very excited to talk about it, guys. Uh, Hung Lee, I wanted to start with you just to tell us a little bit about uh, Sundong and about the cave and give some context for those that may have not seen it yet or don't know what's going on. So just tell us a little bit about it. Um, so I wonder any of you guys have um, read um, Journey to the Center of the Earth by uh, Junsbeck. Classic. So, yes. Yeah. That's the kind of book that I grew up on. And when I heard that they actually found something like that in my own country, I got really excited. So you can imagine it's like um, the movie Avatar kind of thing. It's a completely different world. It is a, a cave, the biggest cave in the world. And it's five million years old, wow. but they just found out about it seven years ago. So basically it preserves the perfect condition of planet Earth five million years ago. There are animals and plants that don't exist anywhere else on Earth, but only in this cave. So it's a beautiful place. It's huge, too. It's about um, New York City size. Yeah, it has its own ecosystem. It's practically yeah. another planet, right? Yes. Yeah, it's incredible. So yeah. we have this cave. We found this cave. Now what's going on? So um, as you know, like whatever people find a beautiful place, they want to make money out of it. Naturally. Yeah. And um, I mean, I don't, I don't blame my government because Vietnam is a developing country. Um, uh, it makes sense for people want to make money out of this place. It's just that the way they're planning to do it is not sustainable. They want to build a cable car bringing in millions of tourists a year. Right now, um, it's only 1,000 trekking permits per year. but. If they build this cable car, it's going to be 1,000 visitors an hour. That's wild. So. Yeah, and you can only imagine the kind of impact that would have on the space. Yeah. Uh, talk to me, guys, a little bit about what about this story brought you to it and brought you to this project and how you guys got involved. <laughs> like any good story, this one begins in a bar. Um, <laughs> I met a photographer named Jason Speth, who we, we want to make sure we give credit to because um, he took all the incredible photographs, um, and a lot of the footage inside the cave was taken by him as well. Um, but I met him, and he happened to just mention to me uh, that he had a permit to enter this cave. And what I thought was remarkable was that I had never heard about the world's largest cave. Yeah. And not only that, but it was only recently discovered, and I, it, was, it kind of blew my mind that we could still discover places on Earth. Um, so we kind of decided to tell this story in virtual reality because it, it gives you um, the best kind of idea of how large uh, the cave is, um, and, and yeah. And a great thing about virtual reality as well is that it takes people places that um, they can't go. You know, there's only a few permits a year um, that are usually reserved uh, far in advance for this cave, and so, um, I mean, the chance that, I mean, and now knowing that this cave is in danger, people might not ever be able to see this cave the way that we can see it now. So it, it, It's sort of a, a, a way to capture a moment in time, really. Uh, I was talking to you guys briefly a little bit backstage. I watched it uh, in a couple of different formats. I watched it on uh, my laptop, and I looked in 360. I watched it uh, holding my phone up and looking around. But when I put it into a set of VR goggles and I actually like experienced it, there's a moment, I think it's in part two, where you guys drop a 3D rendering of the proposed cable car into the space. And there was a, a reaction that I wasn't anticipating and, and, and experiencing it that way. And seeing the scale of it, looking around, understanding, seeing the tiny people, the massive, and the rocks in which it's going to go. I'm curious, you guys were physically there, but was there a moment uh, that surprised you when you experienced the, the finished product for the first time? Or was there a moment that stood out for you uh, experiencing it in VR? Um, yeah, uh, like you when you're when you're on the ground, you're shooting these things and you're collecting um, these images. Um, you know, you don't you don't really you know you give an idea of what it is that you want to create and of what you're trying to convey. But um, when you see it all together, um, all the people you get to revisit. The, I mean, because you're in VR, you get to revisit all the people that you got to meet. Um, um, everyone that kind of helped you out along the way, carried your stuff yeah. when you were hiking through the jungle. Um, all of that uh, put together. Um, you know, you, you get the same um, like emotions that even like Hung said that she got. Uh, she's like, "Wow!" Like I, I I cried, and I was like, "Wow!" Like yeah, it was, it was it was like being back there, you know. So it was great. I am. Um, I rewatched it again, you know, for the zillionth time last night, and I always get really emotional 
um, when one of the people that we interviewed talks about, he kind of likens it to an ex a spiritual experience going into the cave. Um, and that for me, that always gets me because you feel that too. Um, I remember the end of part two where, um, so Tarek interviewed a guy, uh, a local farmer, and he sang a folk song. And Hi, oh, his name's Hi. Yeah, Hi sang that folk song, and Tarek used it as the background of right. the- It was at the end. Yeah, the end of part two, and that was where I broke down and cried. It just, yeah. it, it, it brought me back home, and it's a beautiful moment. Yeah, it really is, agreed. Uh, I wanna talk just for a second uh, about this whole cable car idea, and I feel like uh, this seems like a silly question. Through exhaustive research, you have an answer here, but you're right, it, it, at first glance it makes sense, right? Because here's a way to bring in a lot of money and you take into consideration the economic situation over there. But uh, the other side of that, when you look at it, the construction costs, the, the health risks, the safety risks, all of these things, wouldn't it just take the environmental impact out for a second? Financially, it just doesn't seem like a great plan, right? Like, or am I wrong in that assumption? Like, it seems like a terrible idea from the ground up. And they've acknowledged that. They, oh. they very well know that um, they're creating a risk by putting this cable car in there. Um, but I, I, it seems like the monetary benefits are outweighing the risks right now, and that's why we're so against this. Yeah, these, these caves are actually limestone. Um, which um, erodes so fast. Uh, so building any infrastructure um, in there, like it's, it's just kind of doomed to fail. Even when Jason um, was in the cave, he said he was in one of the um, dough lines, which is these openings in the top of the cave that allowed light in, you know, and uh, he, they, were, they, were, they were hiking around and like a rock collapsed and, 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 and a tree fell in. It said sounded like thunder, but like it just goes to show that these, these caves are always shifting. Yeah. Um, you can only hike through them a few months out of the year because they flood. It's a river, and so you know it erodes, it changes um, every time that every year that, get, that 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 they get to go back in. So um, to build anything um, seems just kind of crazy. Yeah, the cave is very much a living thing, and you try to put any of these fixed, man-made things in in the middle of it. It's obviously a recipe for disaster. Uh, what, what's what's crazy though, you know, Hung, you've been doing this for at least three years, I believe, right? Uh, and it's been a long and difficult road, I'm sure. Uh, but what's, what's crazy to me is there's something universal in, in the struggle. Like you look at Standing Rock here in the US, you look at, I don't know, our president's reluctance to acknowledge climate change and react appropriately for an example. I'm just throwing that out there. But my point is, there, there are these things. What do you think it is whenever uh, you have these environmental issues, these conservationist issues, these, these long-term goals that we're trying to achieve, what is it that makes these particular fights so difficult and so, and so hard? To me, it's because we have that anthro centric view. We think that the entire world was formed to serve us. We are the center of the universe. And we have the right to, what, to make whatever benefits us more important than what's important for the earth. And I think these fights will not stop until we change that mindset. So. I think it too makes it easier because people don't know about Sundong yet. I mean, if they were trying to build a cable car to the top of Mount, Ever Mount Everest, the fight might be a little bit more apparent, but because a lot of people don't know about Sundong in the first place, it makes it a little bit more difficult to, to, to reason with people and tell them that they need to save it when they've only just heard about it. Uh, Vietnam is also, um, like, they have a very, very closed uh, view of what's actually really going on uh, media-wise. Uh, it's a socialist country. And um, so the government has control of what the people see, um, which, uh, you know, uh, gives them, you know, it, it, it leaves them privy to, to uh, getting things done without the knowledge of the people. Um, and even in the constitution of Vietnam, um, the people are allowed to know, like, there's a right for them to know what's going on in their national parks. It's written in there. And, uh, um, and like the interest of big business and, uh, you know, behind the scenes business. Um, yeah. Well, you, uh, you touched on this briefly uh, in an earlier response about how uh, the only way to currently get to the cave, it's really expensive, it's only so many people a year, it's very exclusive, and 
you know, surrounding the cave area is one of the poorest regions. So a lot of people, public opinion is, oh, this is great, put it in so we can finally all go see the cave. Uh, hopefully this film is part of educating people as to why that's not the best course of action. But with the, the government having a, a say in what the people get to see and hear and all that, uh, have you guys had difficulty exposing people to this film and, and getting them to, to sort of see the other side and understand? How has that process been? How has it been using this as a tool for that? It's a little bit of a challenge just because, yeah. um, you know, there's watching virtual reality is not the most easy or accessible thing right, right. now. Um, one thing that we did, though, that I think helped is that we uh, all of the both pieces are uh, translated into Vietnamese so that you can watch it in Vietnamese. Um, Hung, right now, we're working on getting a, a touring uh, exhibition uh, for these two pieces so that more people in Vietnam can see it. Um, when we when we went and when we started doing this film, there was only one uh, newspaper newspaper who had been able to actually write an article um, about this iteration of companies trying to come in and build the cable car. Um, so it is still a struggle, um, not just in the U.S. but in in Vietnam, to get people to be able to view this film in 360 in, in virtual reality. So we're hoping that um, in bringing headsets, yeah. it'll help. Well, I certainly, if you can, the experience speaks for itself. If you can get people to put the headset on and watch it, I think you're going to see some amazing things. Uh, we're going to go to audience Q&A in a little bit, but uh, you have to indulge me. Uh, I have some tech questions. I'm very much a, a geek on this stuff, and I'm very fascinated by the process. So uh, first and foremost, when you're out there and you're, you're in the field and you're getting ready to film in 360 and in VR, are, are you approaching... How are you approaching it in a way that's different from maybe a traditional uh, two-dimensional shot, right? Are you still looking for things to guide the audience's eye in a certain direction? Are, are, are you looking at it in a completely different way? Walk me through what's in your head as you're approaching the space and like, all right, we have to capture this. Maybe even um, more so than in framed um, capture where you have to guide um, the attention of the viewer yeah. uh, because they can look anywhere. Um, your visual cues have to... Um, be drawing you to the subject, to where you want um, these people to go. Um, people also have very short attention spans. They're getting shorter and shorter every day. And so um, uh, like having things for people to look at uh, besides, you know, like you have your subject and you, know, you want to see some mountains or something, something for them to, you know, kind of look around and be able to appreciate um, and really kind of um, fortify what it is that's going on in that scene. It worked out for us that this piece was about a cave, though, because you naturally kind of <laughs> want to look around. Uh, yeah. For sure. Well, I have a really stupid question. Uh, when you guys are doing the one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews, uh, where's the crew? I looked around. I was like, there's, there's nobody else in this room. Like, how are they doing? I was <laughs> under the camera. Were you really? <laughs> I'm like this underneath the camera, just like sitting there. <laughs> Is it like an Inspector Gadget hat almost, <laughs> where it's just like this, you like Doc yeah. Brown in the opening of Back to the Future. You have this giant apparatus on. Because, uh, yeah, I was looking around, I was like, this is fascinating. Yeah. Um, um, sometimes we drop the camera and we run, too, which, you know, makes us look really, really suspicious, yeah, especially right? in foreign countries. Yeah. There's a lot of running and hiding and jumping and diving behind bushes and, and rocks and things. Um, Not for nothing. If you're going to edit it later, is running necessary? Couldn't you just as easily, like, casually walk away? Couldn't you? Yeah, but sometimes what you want to, like what you want is happening then. You're like, oh yeah, my it's God, happening this in the is moment. it. Like, yeah, and you and, have to get and, it. Fair enough, fair enough. And so yeah. you have to kind of get out of there. And I'm sure um, if we like edited together a blooper reel of yeah. us you know, hiding behind things or attempting to, um, it'd, be, it'd be pretty funny to watch. <laughs> that, that should be like part 2B. That should be like, <laughs> <laughs> like you should do that. Um, what's like, what are we talking about this size? Like how invasive is the camera? I know you look at something like an iMac shoot and that thing is like three times the size of the cameras that we have here or something. How big is the 360 rig? Like is it, is it really uh, easy to transport? Oh, it looks like a spaceship. It's, really? It's, oh, it's, it's cool. Uh, when people don't, aren't, aren't, aren't used to seeing these cameras, um, they are definitely taken back by it. And you get a lot of, uh, you drop the camera and you like go to look and see what, what's happening in the scene and um, people taking pictures of it, yeah. people just stopping and looking. Um. It, for some reason, people like to get really, really close to this camera. Um, it's, we did this project in partnership with Google. Um, we're super thankful for them. And we used the Google Odyssey camera for this project in particular, and we actually brought two of them. Um, but it's really interesting to go to, we've been to Cuba, we've been to Vietnam, we've been to a bunch of different countries, um, and it's really interesting how many people, like, I'm always surprised by how many people just look at the camera and automatically know what it is. Yeah. Um, so. 
Uh, you know, you mentioned that it looks like a spaceship, and I don't know if this is me just wanting to compound all of the existing cool tech into one thing, but was there any thought given to perhaps a, a drone 360 shot, like to sort of hover from the top of the cave, or can you even do that in that space? You, were you afraid to, maybe for... There, there has been some drone work done in there. Um, a drone to carry this camera would be a very big drone, Got it. and the permits to get uh, that thing in there, especially so last minute when it went from... Um, sitting at a bar to a meeting to like them telling us about what's happening and we're like, oh, this is like this is a story. Like let's let's go. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think we, we were from 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 start to finish, we were in the country within a month um, of finding out about this. So we didn't have time. Um, uh, but uh, Jason, he had a drone with him and um, he said it was really weird. The thing just kinda went haywire when he was in there. He like threw it up there just kind of secretly uh, when people weren't looking. And he said it went it went dark and it was flying around by itself and then hit the wall and wow. <laughs> there there is literally there is so much we don't know about that space like it's incredible because yeah. who knows what's happening in their environment wise that affects all of that and the best part is they probably haven't even discovered the largest cave yet um, the chances that there's a cave that's bigger than Sundong are actually quite high that's incredible yeah they said they're um, they, just, they they discovered what three hundred more last year and. In total, they've only maybe maybe discovered 25% of all the caves in the area. Uh, it, it's, it's so wild. crazy, like in a day and age with Google Earth, where you can explore everything that you think we found everything. Like you were saying this earlier, it's like, no, there's still so much that we have yet to find. Uh, one last 360 question, and then we'll uh, plug some stuff and go to the audience Q&A. But what, uh, what are some of the challenges that you're most excited about tackling when you're working in 360 and VR? Something that's fun to kind of solve for. Um, I think the thing that's most exciting about VR right now is that it's um, so new and it's just so recently become um, something that people are like recognizing as a, like a medium that is, go is, is going somewhere. It was up in the air for a while and uh, Riot, we jumped on it pretty early. Yeah. Uh, lucky enough to get some good stuff out there um, early on that kind of set us in a place where uh, we had some credibility. But um, to see the push behind it right now uh, with the technology, with um, the stories and the things that people are trying to do, um, it's really exciting. It, 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 just, it just shows that the sky's the limit with uh, what we can do. For me, it's that we can still experiment. Um, you know, there haven't really been standards that are set quite yet, yeah. um, which allows us the flexibility to kind of make up our own rules, which is always fun. Uh, as promised, audience Q&A, but before we do that, one last thing. I know if you go to riot.org, uh, you can see the film there. Uh, other places, obviously, we can see it in the lobby in just a minute. Uh, but Hung Lei, I'd love for you to tell us uh, any resources or sites that we can go to to help, to, to further the cause, to donate, and be a part of the movement. Where, where can we go? So um, the next activity that we do is, like um, Avery said, we want to do an, a traveling exhibition so more people can see this. Right. Um, in order for us to do that, and we want to do that exhibition in both Vietnam and in the U.S., in order for us to do that, we, um, we're having a crowdfunding site on um, Indiegogo. Great. So if you go on Indiegogo and search for Sundong, or you go on our, um, our link is igg.me slash at slash save Sundong, it's going to take you to our crowdfunding page. And guys, did I miss anything? Riot.org, obviously an obvious uh, place to go. Any, any other uh, thing that YouTube we should YouTube as well. Um, yeah, YouTube as well. Google is a, a, a huge part in helping us do this. And so on, on YouTube is where you can... It's, very, very cool. It's where its home is for now. Yeah. And guys, you don't need uh, a Samsung uh, Gear VR is awesome. I had a, a cardboard headset that I was able to do at home. It's, it's super easy, yeah, to, to check this out and see it the way it was intended. Let's go ahead and turn it over. Audience q and I see some mics floating around right here. First one. Hi, good morning. Hi. Um, so how long did it take for you to shoot this, and like, when did you know it was done? For this project in particular, um, it's called the turnaround because we have a really quick turnaround. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's quite obvious, but um, I thought so, that was a 360 play because yeah. you had it's to turn both. around. It's oh, both. that's how you know it's a good title, yeah. right? Yeah. It's got a it's, bunch of meanings. It's, yeah. it's layered <laughs> like an onion. All right, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was it's just okay. going to go for it. Go for it. Um, so we found out about it. We had about a month to do pre-production, uh, and then we were actually on the ground in Vietnam for almost two weeks, not even two weeks, um, and then we we had uh, two weeks to edit it. Actually, we had a week to edit part one and another week to edit part two. So this is very quick. Um, and we knew it was done when we ran out of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just um, you tend to just overshoot, uh, get as much as you can, um, hoping that um, it'll, all, it'll all pan out. Um, 
but in this in this case it did like you said like going back and watching it you know it's just proof positive that we've we've done it and a huge shout out to our editors um amy uh rosner and lorraine cardoza uh, this film would not have been possible without them karen matsumoto daryl chong travis cook ali all of them. did that awesome ali ali bowden awesome animation how, how nice was it to finally sleep after two weeks when this was done <laughs> Yeah, to get back from Vietnam and then go into two weeks of editing, uh, jet lag was yeah. really fun. Oh, I was jet lagged for weeks. I can't even fathom. Uh, next question right over here. Hey, guys. Uh, so um, after experiencing this, uh, you know, this viewing experience, like, do you guys hope to uh, utilize that for like, future projects as well? This viewing experience is in 360 or this this video? Yeah, the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I selfishly want to do a part three. <laughs> I think we all want to do a part three. Anything to go back yeah. to Vietnam. If you haven't been able to go to Vietnam, go. It's beautiful. The people are amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. I believe we have time for one more question right here. Hello. Thank you for being here. Hi. So uh, what, what, what was your uh, experience? Uh, what was your takeaway with, with doing this project? What have you learned from, from each of you uh, from ma making this project? Should we go first, who? Well, one thing that, um, for me, um, the, I remember the first time that I met Avery in um, their office in LA. And when I was pitching this to you, I wasn't expecting that reaction that you had. And, and that, that, was, that was very meaningful for me because I've been doing this for three years and there are certain times that I feel so lonely doing this, like saving a cave, even though it's the world's largest cave, but it is a cave. How many people out there would actually care about my cave? And when I get to talk to Avery and then Tarek and then see the excitement, I know that there's a chance for my cave to be saved. There are people out there in the world that actually care about places like this. So yeah. I'm getting emotional. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that is, that is a beautiful note for us to wrap this up on. It, it is a cave, but it is a beautiful cave, and uh, thank you for fighting for it. Uh, everybody, uh, well, if you're, for those at home, go to riot.org and check out the film. It's super easy to do. There's no reason not to do it. For everyone here, we're going to go out in the hallway and check it out together. But before we do that, join me one more time. Round of applause. Tarek, Avery, and Hanalei, please. Thank you, guys. Thank you.